As you guys can see in the title and thumbnail of today's video, we are going to be comparing two relatively new cameras that have come out within the past couple of years that are right around that $4,000 price range when it comes to the cinema line of cameras. My current main go-to camera, my main A camera, is indeed the Canon EOS R5C, which originally used to go for about $4,500, and I think now it is $4,399, so pretty much $4,400. But I recently got my hands on the Sony FX3. Shout out to Sony for lending me out the FX3 to do some testing and pretty much work on some of my personal projects. Obviously, today's video, we are going to be looking at both of these cameras and just seeing which one is right for you and the type of shooter you are. All right, so to give a quick backstory between the Canon EOS R5C and the Sony FX3, both of these cameras are within the cinema lineup of their respected brands. So the Canon EOS R5C R5C is in the Canon Cinema EOS lineup, whereas the Sony FX3 is in the Sony Cinema line, um, which has the FX name. So obviously these cameras are geared towards uh, cinematographers and filmmakers who want to get that cinema-like quality, but pretty much in a portable and small form factor. When it comes to these two cameras, I'm not necessarily trying to make a full-on head-to-head comparison between the two or trying to figure out which camera is better than the other, or especially if you're someone who is already either a Canon a user or a Sony user to just completely switch into the opposite ecosystem if the other camera seems to suit you better because ultimately at the end of the day like there's no such thing as a perfect camera like there's never going to be a camera that's going to have every single feature that you want but of course the biggest thing is can you make up for it and are you willing to make up for it and again how can you integrate it into your workflow where it doesn't frustrate you to the way where you just need to get rid of it. When it comes to what the Canon EOS R5C has on its body it does have a Safe Express Type-B card slot, has UHS-2, it has time code, it has USB Type-C, micro HDMI, pretty much has the audio inputs and outputs, has remote control, and it does have the multi-shoe adapter on the top. And of course, it does have its built-in fan in order to prevent overheating in things like high-end 4K, 4K 120. And of course, since it is an 8K camera, it really does help in that situation. And especially with the Canon EOS R5C being my main go-to camera, especially within the past year alone, the best way of how I can describe this camera is that it has honestly been a beast in its work. Like this is easily one of the best all-in-one hybrid cameras that you can buy. Now, even though it is still a part of the Cinema EOS lineup from Canon, it is still also very much a photo camera, especially since it does have two operating systems built into the camera. Whereas with the Sony FX3, it does have CF Express Type A, UHS-2. It does have a full HDMI compared to the R5C, where the R5C is micro HDMI. It does have your microphone input. It has your headphone jack. Um, it's got Type C. And again, you are obviously getting that full frame sensor. And it does also have an inbuilt fan. So again, also for overheating in its high-end 4K. And of course, since this camera can go up to 1080p, 240 frames per second, it can definitely help in that scenario. And especially with my time operating with the Sony FX3, like this camera has honestly been growing on me a bit because I feel like this is a true pocket cinema camera. Now, for those who are cinematographers and for those who know their cameras, you guys probably know of Blackmagic pocket cinema cameras. And if you're comparing this camera to the pocket cinema from Blackmagic, like this is definitely a lot more of a pocket cinema camera. Like I've even tested it out myself. This thing can actually fit into my pocket, just the body alone. So the fact that you're getting all of that capability is just really, really impressive. Both cameras do have tally lights for recording with the R5C having it in the front. Whereas with the FX3, it does have a couple of different tally lights. It has one in the front and uh, one on the back. And of course, once you hit the record button on the top, uh, the record button does light up as well. So it does have a little bit more with the FX3 compared to the R5C, but again, it's more than enough for what you need. And it is a really nice feature that both cameras do have that option to have tally lights so you can tell when you're recording and when you're not recording because there's a lot of times where you may think you're recording, but you're really not recording in general. So that feature definitely comes in handy. So when it came to taking out both of the Sony FX3 and the R5C out for testing, I wanted to keep this test as fair as possible and also as unbiased as possible. I know I've spent more time with the R5C, but I really wanted to give a fair comparison to the FX3 because I do know that it is a camera that's more well suited for video, whereas the R5C is obviously a cinema camera, but it is still a photo camera just as much as it is a video camera. When it came to the lenses that I was using for the R5C, I've been using my main go-to lens that I've had for a very long time and that I absolutely love, which is the RF 1535 F2.8. However, with the Sony FX3, I actually don't really own any full frame lenses. So I went ahead and went to go pick up the original Sony G Master 24 to 70. And honestly, I had no idea how dense this lens is. And when I put this lens on the FX3, I actually noticed that the FX3 with the original G Master 24 to 70 F2.8 is actually quite a bit heavier with the R5C 
and the 1535 combined. But with these lenses, I decided to do a majority of the test being shot on a 24 mil or a 35 mil because that's kind of the range that both of these lenses can line up to. So when it came to putting these cameras side by side, some of the categories that I wanted to go through was overall image quality, which includes colors, dynamic range, detail. So right now we are recording 8K raw light on the Canon EOS R5C. On the Sony FX3, we do have it on its 4K uh, all intros. So again, this is a test between its 8K and 4K. So this is just to give you guys an example of what it's like to record at the highest quality on both of these cameras. Of course, the R5C, since it does have that 45 megapixel sensor, obviously it's able to record something such as 8K raw, which is just crazy. And also the original R5 has the capabilities to do 8K raw, but of course the R5C is a lot better, especially for those that want to do a lot long-term uh, 8K. With the Sony FX3, of course, it doesn't have capabilities like 8K because it is a 12 megapixel sensor. But of course, once you do hook it up to an external monitor or an external recorder like the Atom Messenger 5, you can get up to 16-bit linear RAW. So as for the log formats and the LUTs that you have on both the Canon EOS R5C and the Sony FX3, the R5C does have its base Rec. 709, so that's really good, especially for someone who doesn't necessarily care about color grading a lot and you just want something that's really good straight out of camera. Um, but that can still hold a decent amount of dynamic range and you're not having to deal with a terrible picture. Now, whereas with Sony, it does have its S-Log variants, so I know a lot of popular ones are S-Log 2, S-Log 3, um, but of course this camera also does has s Cinetone, which is also in its bigger brothers with the Sony FX6 and the Sony FX9. Alright, so when it does come to vlogging, the Canon EOS R5C has been one of my biggest go-tos since pretty much the time when I got the camera, and of course once I got my hands on the Lumix S5, that officially turned into my new vlog camera just because it's a lot lighter, it's a lot smaller, it's more compact, and it just works as a better running gun. And because I got my hands on the Lumix S5, I didn't necessarily need to bring my Canon EOS R5C that much anymore when it came to my running gun production stuff or client base work, and it just became more of my in-studio and just more of my bigger production camera, doing a small little vlog test. And obviously one of the biggest and the nicest things with the FX3 compared to the R5C is since the FX3 is a lower megapixel sensor, it can capture in more light, which makes this camera a much better camera in low light. So this thing is a low light beast compared to the R5C. Again, the R5C is still really good. It does have a max ISO of 51,200 with its secondary base ISO at 3,200. However, with the Sony FX3, it does have its base ISO at 800, but it does have a dual base ISO at 12,800. Another is autofocus performance since I do know that Canon and Sony are pretty much some of the best brands when it comes to their mirrorless cameras for their autofocus performance um, and obviously some other things when it comes to overall usability, you know, the operating systems, the menus, um, and of course, battery life. With the R5C, it does have plenty of codecs to choose from, so especially if you are someone who doesn't want to take up a whole lot of space on your memory cards, you can go with a long up codec or H.265 and save up a lot on that as well. Um, but if you're someone who wants to get that level of 8K quality, but within 4K, you can record an XFAVC, which is a very popular codec in Canon Cinema line of cameras, and that's something that you'll see in uh, other Canon Cinema cameras, and that's actually one thing that's not in the Canon R5. And of course, with the Canon EOS R5C, it does have its raw capabilities. Of course, there are features like having raw light, raw standard, and it does have its raw HQ, but instead of recording in 8K, you're gonna be recording in 5K. But again, it is still very impressive to see what is on the R5C because the fact that you can go up to 8K60 and you can also have autofocus with 8K60 as long as you do have a USB PD charger plugged in, it's really impressive of the image quality that you can get. Whereas with the Sony FX3, again, this is a very steady and stable and reliable camera when it comes to video work, but it does have its XAVC CS, um, SH, SI. Um, so obviously if you want to either record in a really low megabit or if you want to record in a high megabit, it does have that option. Now again, when it comes to details between the FX3 and the R5C, obviously the R5C is gonna be a lot sharper because it does have that 45 megapixel sensor. However, again, when it comes to video, it's not always about megapixels. And of course with the FX3, it's gonna be able to capture in a lot more light, especially since there are a smaller amount of megapixels compared to the R5C. Each of those megapixels is a lot bigger, which allows more light to come in, which allows for better detail in those uh, lower resolution, which obviously gets us into colors and dynamic range. So when it comes to colors, both of them do have the availability of 10 bit 4 to 2 which has been pretty much one of the latest standards since 2020 with the Canon EOS R5 and pretty much majority of cameras since then. Now between the two cameras, both of the companies state that their cameras can do up to 15 stops at dynamic range, and it may be true with the FX3. Whereas with the R5C, I would say that 14 to 15 stops would be a sufficient number to put upon 
when it comes to its raw recording. But if you're not shooting in raw, it's definitely not as good when it comes to its XF AVC or when it comes to its H.265. If you are recording in XAVC SI, you are obviously going to be getting the best image quality out of the sensor and out of the camera, and that will definitely produce a really good dynamic range. Now, as for each of these cameras' log profiles, the Sony FX3 pretty much has majority of the same log formats as their other cameras. It has S-Log, S-Log2, and of course S-Log3. So again, when it comes to that, a lot of Sony shooters are going to feel very much at home with this camera. Camera. Whereas with the R5C, you are getting C-Log and C-Log 3. Sadly, there's no C-Log 2. I know a lot of us Canon shooters have been asking Canon for C-Log 2. However, if you are recording in RAW, it is possible to transform the footage uh, closer to C-Log 2. So it is possible to get to very similar dynamic range and the color quality of C-Log 2 if you are recording in RAW. But personally, I think that C-Log 3 also does work for majority of the time. Sure, it may not give you as much flexibility as C-Log 2 in the shadows and in some of the areas with the colors, but I still think that it does produce a good enough result for a majority of people who are gonna be using this camera. Another big thing to talk about between the R5C and the FX3 is what kind of feature set do you want to have within a camera? Are you looking for a camera that has uh, more resolution or are you looking for a camera that has more frame rates? And it really just depends on the user because some users really do prefer having uh, more resolution, especially if you are working in VFX or you just wanna save and capture as much detail as possible within the footage. Whereas some people would prefer having that higher frame rate. And again, it can really come in handy if you are doing things like action sports or just a lot more fast paced um, you know, movement in your footage and you're just gonna need to record in a higher frame rate. So that way you would have that flexibility to be able to slow it down or speed it up in post. As a reviewer, I can only just tell you from my own perspective. And of course, I'm trying to make this as unbiased as possible. When you are taking a look at a camera, like obviously make sure that you can get one of these cameras in your hands, uh, at least to give it a test. So of course, if you guys can rent them out, kind of get a feel for the ergonomics. Cause again, there are so many different things when it comes to buying a new camera. It's not just what the camera can do, but of course it's, if if you feel comfortable with that certain camera because for me since i am a current r5c user i really do like this camera again there are obviously flaws with this camera sure the battery life doesn't last as long as i would have liked especially with that lp6 uh, nh battery but of course there are workarounds like having that uh, anchor power cord charger or just an external uh, portable charger again for me who really dislikes the rf line of lenses the rf1535 easily my favorite lens that I currently own. But of course, in my time of testing the Sony FX3, and of course, I'm very grateful for Sony to lend this out and for me to make this video on. One thing that I wanna talk about with the FX3 is that this camera can get extremely expensive. And I'm not just talking about the body or the lenses, but especially the media. And if you guys are looking at the prices of CF Express Type A, it is absolutely crazy. And just to get an 80 gigabyte card, it's literally like almost $200. And it's insane because you can get a 512 gig CF Express Type B for your Canon R5 or R5C for pretty much the same price. When it comes to the FX3, definitely be careful when you are buying media for this camera because it can get pretty expensive in the long run. So definitely do be careful with it. All right, so before we conclude this video between the R5C and the FX3, some of the last few things that I wanna talk about is the strengths and weaknesses between the two. When it comes to the strengths of either of these cameras, starting off with the R5C, Again, this camera is a true beast and a true hybrid camera. Now, again, even though it is in the cinema line of Canon ca cameras, it is important to remember that this is not just a video camera, but it is a photo camera and works just as well as the R5 minus the IBIS. But of course, if you do have an IS lens, it definitely does help uh, when it comes to capturing that image. Um, but when it comes to the video side of this camera, it is really, really impressive. The fact that you're able to get 8K 60 frames per second raw internal with 12 bit. And as I mentioned before, one of the things that I absolutely love about the R5C is with having the cinema operating system, the fact that it gives you controls of shutter angle, false color, waveform, all into a mirrorless form factor, I think is really impressive. And it is impressive because even the camera that I'm recording on right now, the Lumix S5, this camera does have things like shutter angle, which is just really impressive. And one of the downsides I think with the Sony FX3 is since this camera doesn't necessarily have those true cinema features like shutter angle, false color, waveform, I think that is easily the biggest flaw with this camera. But if Sony can't implement that, I really don't see what else is wrong with the FX3. I mean, maybe to give us internal ND on either of these cameras, I would say would be one of the biggest 
uh, you know, victories with these types of cameras because if we can get internal ND on, you know, these mirrorless cameras, I think that would be the biggest game changer. Now for the Sony FX3, when it comes to its strengths over the R5C, definitely when it comes to capturing in a bit more dynamic range, having things like S-Log3, um, you know, as Cinetone, and especially with this camera being so good in low light, this camera is easily just one of those that you can toss into any run and gun situation, both, uh, you know, solo shooting, or even if you are on a bigger production, I think the FX3 really comes in handy. And the fact that the FX3 is actually Netflix approved, which is one of the things that I'm really sad about the R5C, that it's not a Netflix approved camera. Canon and Netflix, please work out your differences, get this camera Netflix approved because it already has everything necessary to be a Netflix approved camera. I think the biggest wish list for the Sony FX3 is to get those cinema features. Like it calls itself a cinema camera. If Sony can implement that into the FX3, I think this camera will be easily one of the best that you can get within its price range. And of course, since it is a really compact full frame beast. But of course, making this video more towards people that are looking to build an ecosystem, right? Like if you're already a Canon shooter um, and you are looking at one of these two cameras and you are debating between them, like my biggest thing that I can recommend is just to stick to Canon. Like the R5C is already a great camera, but let's say you are a Canon shooter, but you do prefer the capabilities and the reliability of the FX3 and you're simply just looking for a video camera and you don't necessarily need a hybrid with photo and video like the R5C. And if you are a Canon shooter, I highly recommend going for the C70. Now the C70 is definitely a bit more expensive compared to this camera, but you are gonna be getting the great reliability of the FX3. You're gonna be getting dual UHS-2 card slots, so you don't necessarily need to you know, go crazy about CF Express type, uh, type B or Type A, and you can easily save yourself a lot of money just getting UHS-2. And you're also gonna be getting internal ND. Now obviously the biggest thing with the C70 is that it is a Super 35 sensor, but if you do have Canon EF glass, once you put on that 0.7, and one times adapter, you're pretty much gonna be getting a full frame look out of the camera. So definitely if you are a Canon shooter, but you like the FX3, you don't wanna necessarily switch your entire ecosystem. I would say that the Canon C70 is going to be a great choice for you. And there have been a lot of times where even I've considered the C70, because for me, I'm someone who is just simply and mainly a cinematographer and a videographer, and I don't necessarily need the full on 45 megapixels. Since I do want to invest more into RF lenses, and I do like full frame, I think that's just one of the biggest issues. So if there is ever gonna be a C70 Mark II that's going to have that full frame sensor, I think that's gonna be the move for me if I am looking to upgrade. But for the time being, again, still very happy with the R5C. But if you are a Sony shooter and you like the hybrid functionality of the R5C, you like the 8K capabilities, you like 4K 120, um, and just something in that uh, form factor, again, a great option for Sony shooters is the Sony A1. It's a camera that came out quite a while back, I think probably in 2021 or you know 2020, around the time that the R5 or the R5C came out. But again, it is also a very good camera. It can still get you 4K 120, can get you 8K 30. Um, I think the only thing about that camera is that it doesn't have a flip out screen. So probably one of the only downsides with that camera. But other than that, it is still a very good camera to get. And with that, that is gonna do for us on today's video. Now, I know that there is still a lot more to talk about between the FX3 and the R5C. And of course, if you guys have any more questions and also just my personal experience using these cameras, let me know down in the comments below. I'm more than happy to respond to you guys there. And uh, I feel like I've kind of talked about majority of the stuff that I've wanted to get my points across with both of these cameras. Again, they're both really great for what they do. FX3, really good, reliable for video. R5C, really good for hybrid shooters. And of course, for people that want a video focused camera first, but of course has great photo capabilities on the side. And yeah, just let me know down in the comments below if you guys have any more questions and that is going to do for us. So make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you guys in the next video. Peace.